morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house today. A, a great joy to have you here worshiping with us, trusting in God's mercy for us as we travel through Lent and actually all of our life. Uh, the mercy that he's given to us in Jesus Christ. So what a great gift he has for you today. Our service is, uh, our order of service is Divine Service Setting 1. Uh, that's found on page 151 if you're kind of new to the area. Um, on, the back, on the back of the bulletin is the outline for the service. And then we'll be using our hymnal to, uh, to connect with that. So we'll be on page 151. But then we're going to have the uh, ringing of the bells and the singing of our first hymn. But as is typical of our church, we are going to rise and greet one another with joy and peace. turning to page 151 for the invocation and our confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment for silence reflection on God's word and our own self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God,
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. You want to try that again? <laughs> <laughs> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Turn now to page 156 for the salutation and the colic. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is taken from Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moriah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord, 
and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward, toward the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn now to the front of our hymnal, to, to Psalm 121. Psalm 121 in the front there, and we will together responsibly read that, and I will begin. Sing that. I lift my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle is taken from Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. St. Paul writes, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gave life to the dead and called into existence the things that do not exist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise now for the verse and the gospel. Hmm. Return to...
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. And this text is the basis for our sermon today. Now there was a man, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one, has set, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of our Lord. The congregation may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 708.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text for today's sermon is taken from our gospel reading in John chapter 3, and it is entitled, This is the Way. John 3.16. Really, what more needs to be said? John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. Right? It comes from the Gospel of John. We know this. And in many aspects, it is the simplest, simplest and clearest explanation and expression of Jesus, who he is, and what he has come to do. What he has come to earth to do. Quite simply, Jesus came to earth to save the world. That's pretty simple. Save the world, though, from what? What has he come to save the world from? From itself. From Satan. And most obviously, he came to save the world from death. But here's the problem. It is one of Christianity's most often asked questions especially since Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. It's one that we, I try not to tell my people to ask, but it keeps coming up. If Jesus conquered death by his death on the cross, then why do we still die? In order to answer that question, we have to turn back to the book of Numbers and take a look at the Old Testament people of Israel. The children in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, are wandering in the desert. They are partway through their 40-year wandering where God is teaching them, teaching them how to listen to his word, teaching them to trust that he will provide for all their needs, both of body and of spirit. But the children of Israel, you know, they are, they're a little dense. They're a little bit slow to learn. They're a little bit hard-headed. And they're quite a bit rebellious. They are so rebellious, in fact, that God, in his perfect judgment, sends serpents to go and bite them. And many of them die. As St. Paul reminds us, the wages of sin is death. Then we read the following. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Moses agreed because he heard their repentance that they knew their sin and need for redemption. So Moses prayed to God, and God answered Moses by giving him the bizarrest of instructions. Moses, take a fiery serpent. Make a fiery serpent out of bronze and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees the bronze serpent on the pole... He will live. So you have to admit, that's pretty bizarre. Looking at a snake on a stick. Isn't that the snake, which was the form of Satan, that, the form that Satan took back in the Garden of Eden? Well, yes, it is. And that's exactly the point. So two things that really stand out in this episode from the people of God. First is that the form of their salvation isn't much worth looking at. A bronze serpent, not exactly something to give one a whole lot of hope. I think we can see that point. You guys go around holding up bronze serpents going, woo. The second point is a little less obvious. The snakes still come. 
Nowhere in the text do we hear of Moses being like the Pied Piper leading the snakes out to die in the river. God did not take away the serpents. He gave the people a way out, a way to bear up underneath the pain, a way of salvation, so that even though that they were bitten, it didn't kill them. Whoever looked upon the bronze serpent in faith, which means in faith in God's word and promise, that person lived. Now fast forward to Jesus speaking to Nicodemus in our gospel today. Jesus uses the bronze serpent and the pole incident to help Nicodemus see how God works and continues to work. God works in this world just like this. He does not take away death. Not yet, at least. We will have that on the last day, but now it hasn't left us. What he does, though, is send us his son. He sends his son into a world of death so that he dies in our place. We hear in verse 16 that... that uh, we, we, uh, excuse me. Yes, we hear in verse 16. John 3, 16, right? Yeah. But I'm going to do a little bit of paraphrasing here. For God so loved the world in this way. In this way, he handed over his only begotten son. God so loved the world in this way, that he handed over his son. To whom did God send his son? Who did God hand his son over to? He handed Jesus over to sin. Your sin. He handed Jesus over to death. Your death. And he handed Jesus over to Satan himself. That is that unholy trinity that makes up all the evil that we all live in every day. God handed him over to that. This is the way God loved the world. The sinless son of God is handed over to it. Jesus then takes the punishment that you and I deserve. Jesus then gives you the eternal life that he has and is able to give because of who his nature is. And Jesus sets you up as sons and daughters of God Most High in his eternal kingdom. All because God the Father hands him over to death. And oddly enough, death on a cross. Death on a pole, for that matter. So for you here and now, today, beloved, you still suffer death. You suffer the effects of your sin. You suffer the effects of others sinning against you. You get sick and you get injured. Things don't always work the way you want them to or the way they ought to. The serpent still bites at your heels. But Jesus Christ has crushed the head of the serpent. Your evil foe has been crushed. By his death, he destroyed death. And so what we endure, what we suffer now, are merely the after effects, the rumblings and grumblings from a foe who has already been defeated but who still wants to drag God's children down to hell with him, because that's how much full of hate he has. So Nate, make no mistake, my dear beloved, my dear beloved, baptized. You are Christ's. Satan cannot harm you. Jesus does not come in the world to tiss, tiss, tiss your sins away or all your failures. He doesn't come to shake his head at you and urge you to be better the next time. What's wrong with you people? He doesn't come to give you uh, uh, an example to shoot for. 
Because perfection is something you and I cannot meet. His goals are much higher. Much, much higher. Remember again verse 17 from chapter 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that it might be saved through him. That's God's plan for you. And that's God's plan for the entire world. He wants you to be saved. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you, to comfort you, to love you, and to give you hope that no matter how many times the serpent strikes and bites, you may lift up your eyes and your hearts to the cross of Jesus Christ. And in that cross, even though it might look terrible, even might, though it looks like shame and ugliness, even though it might not look like much to the world, to us, that is life. That is forgiveness. That is real forgiveness and real abundant life because that life that Christ gives has no end. So come, blessed of God, and receive the kingdom of heaven prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Come and rejoice in his baptism, his gift of water and spirit. Come and rejoice in joy with the body and blood of Christ for your forgiveness and your strength. And give thanks to God for all of his benefits, for the mercy of God. The mercy of God endures for how long? I want an answer. Forever. Forever. That's a long time. And that's what we get in Christ. Amen. We rise now turning to page 159 as we confess our faith together according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered from the Father, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son has shown your love to the world in his death and resurrection. Give your people hearts to remember your gracious works and to proclaim your name in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you promise us an inheritance not because of your law, but because of your promise to Abraham and to us. In your grace, nourish us in the faith until life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you made your servant Abraham the father of us all through faith. And you have given all fathers a calling, the calling of Abraham, to hand down the gospel of Christ. Fill their hearts with the words of Christ and remember them according to your gracious mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, remember our nation and its leaders. Bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws, and enable us to be good and responsible citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, be near to the sick and the suffering, especially Christy, Helen, Kathy, Dwayne, Rena, Mark, David, Lisa, Kathy, Patrick, Steve and Dottie, Mike, Russell, Suvia and Frank. Comfort them with your divine promise 
and grant healing according to your will. And also be near to those who have lost loved ones, especially the family of Jeff Dietrich, who passed away this week. Let the resurrection of Christ be their comfort and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, Nicodemus was led by the word of Jesus to the cross, and from the cross he received the body of Jesus. Grant us faith like his to trust your word and receive Christ's body and blood in this holy sacrament for the forgiveness, life, and salvation of us all. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated as we gather our offerings, and I encourage you to grab the attendance books located in the center aisle and please fill those out. Uh, especially if you're a guest or visitor, uh, leave a phone number and we will, we will reach out to you. now turning to page 159 for our offertory. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our We hear the words of our Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Turning to page 164, or 165, 166, for the post-communion collect. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Congregation may be seated for a few announcements, and my first is to look to the congregation and see if there's anything that needs to be brought forward. Back there in the back, who is that? Highway 50 cleanup is coming up again on the 18th at 8 a.m. Uh, just a note here, it's a rainy day, so that will be one week later at 8 a.m. in case of pouring rain or mud. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have another, uh, there's a few uh, announcements that I want to make. Um, I said this wrong in early service, but on Saturday, uh, or excuse me, Saturday, April 15th, uh, we are going to have a servant event uh, from Shine. The district has put out this, this, this desire for us to be out in our community. It's called Shine, and the members go out into the community and do work for either, mem either members who are in heavy need or others 
in the community they might need through families. Um, so if you'd like to do that or want some more information, there's some more information in here. Uh, it might be that we go to some people's houses who need yard work, uh, the elderly who might need yard work, and that could be within our church or within our community. So there's all kinds of things that we're going to be looking at as, as far as how we can shine in our community. Other things to remember is that there is a special voters meeting on March 12th after late service. Uh, you all filled out the paperwork for the uh, information about the vicarage program, so we are going to hear that information and then we are going to have a vote on that. So I encourage everyone to attend. And also, uh, uh, March 8th begins bell choir. Um, so if you don't know how to ring a bell, they will teach you. Trust me, they will teach you. Uh, so come and do that. It would be great joy. And finally, uh, just another reminder that we have the Mastacholi uh, dinner fundraiser for, for Christy Meyer directly after this service. So I encourage you all to attend uh, for fellowship, but more importantly, uh, that we can care for one of God's own members uh, in, in this way. So uh, blessings to you. If you uh, are not able to make it today and you still want to care for uh, the Meyer family, uh, you're, you can give a free will offering to the church at any time you like. So you can be at the, at the secretary's office or in the uh, offering, but just make sure you mark it so we know where it goes. Go in peace and serve the Lord.